You can hear Hello? me, Wheelick, right? I am. Yeah, I can hear you. Hello, and everyone, and Hello. welcome. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can oh, hear okay, you clearly. All right. Sorry about the technical problems. <laughs> no worries. Right. No All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this Google Hangout brought to you by Sigma Psi, the Scientific Research Society. Um, my name is Iman Ganim, and I'm the um, director of membership and programs here at Sigma Psi. I just started in a few days ago, actually. Um, today, we'll be talking about how to prepare and um, uh, present a presentation for the Sigma Xi Students Research Showcase Competition, which is coming up. So the deadline for registration is actually March 21st, and the showcase will uh, run from March 28th through um, April 3rd. Um, the showcase uh, addresses a very important aspect of scientific research, which is science communication. Um, it challenges high school students, undergraduates, and graduate students to uh, present the research online. Um, every student participating in the competition will be um, building a website with um, a video, a personal video about the research, a technical presentation, basically a slideshow, and a, um, an abstract. Uh, today I'll be talking uh, to two of last year's winners. Um, one uh, won the undergraduate presentation um, and the graduate presentation. So joining me today is Luca Nigoida. Hello. Hi, Luca. Uh, and I also have online uh, Wilik Chong. Hi, Hi everyone. Hi. Um, and they will share with us their experience, their um, and the challenges they faced, and how they found uh, the participation uh, for them. So, welcome to the hangout. <clears throat> and uh, to start, I'm going to start by asking Luca and um, Willick to present to introduce themselves and give us a little um, a brief idea about their project and what they did for the competition. All right, so, I'll start. Luca, let's start with you. Um, so my name is Luca Nagoida, and I'm a, currently a PhD candidate at Syracuse University Biology. Um, and so my presentation was basically about um, my main dissertation topic, which is about how plants affect ecosystems, uh, and particularly how plant movement or plant dispersal, um, what implications that has for ecosystem functioning. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. I don't know how much detail you want me to go into. Um, I think that's that's good. And I actually wanted also to highlight that uh, the two presentations are available on the website for the showcase uh, competition, and um, the viewers can also go and um, view both of them uh, if they would like to. Um, okay, um, Willick. Hi. So I'll just give a small like. Um, Three sentence introduction to my project. So I'm Willie Chong, and I um, graduated from Oberlin College um, this year. Well, last year actually, now it's 2016. Okay. Anyway, so my project was on gene and environment interaction. Oh, thank you. So my my thesis project was on the gene environment interaction of um, cadmium and alpha synuclein in a cell model of Parkinson's disease. And so effectively, I'm trying to see if um, alpha synuclein expressing cells uh, will actually have greater neurodegenerative loss after um, introduction to cadmium and why and how that happens. Yep. That's All it. right. Uh, thank you, guys. So I would um, like to start with uh, just a, one question is, um, have you, was this your first time um, building a presentation or a video about your research? for the competition last year, or did you do something similar years before? It was my first time. Um, I... Okay. Uh, Luca, you can yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's start with Luca. Um, yeah, so it was my first time doing the research so showcase through Sigma Xi. Um, I've had a little bit of film experience in the past, but, you know, for making the video, but um, otherwise this was my first time doing this. And Luca, were you? Uh, what year were you in grad school when you did that? Um, it would have been my the spring of my third year. Okay. Okay, Willick. Oh, so it's actually my first time making a video for like anything. 
And I mean, I don't count Snapchat videos in that. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it turned out really good. <laughs> Thanks. On <Won> a prize. <laughs> All right. Um, so let me ask you guys, what motivated you to participate in this contest? Uh, Luca. Well, um, definitely a few things. So I'm really excited about trying to bridge the gap between um, the scientific community and a broader audience. Um, and so that, that in and of itself was kind of a, a big pull for me. Um, the other thing is I often find it pretty hard explaining my research to a broader audience. So I thought that this would actually, you know, like whenever friends and family would ask me what I'm doing, it, you know, I'd kind of get into that awkward moment where I try to explain my science and uh, so I wanted, hard, to get, right? <laughs> I wanted to get better at that yeah and so I thought this would be a good experience for that um, and then also I thought it would help me actually improve the research because I was actually presenting on a project that I hadn't uh, completed yet um, it's all part of my dissertation but the project per se that I presented on I hadn't done yet and a lot of the, the scientific um, aspects of it that I was trying to get better at um, explaining um, like I guess I thought that you know by having to explain it to a broader audience and just have that discussion with a scientific and, and general community would help me uh, better understand some of the aspects of the research that I was still working on developing. That's actually a great point um, which is often neglected in um, scientific communication and the fact that it helps you better understand your own science uh, when you have to talk about it to other people. Mm. Um, same thing as sure. like a poster presentation, one feels like, oh, actually now I get that when you have to explain it to someone else. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Uh, yep. So, what about uh, Willick? One of the motivations I had when I first started making a video was that, oh, when I joined the competition, was that, you know, I have a year to um, do my project because it's an uh, undergraduate thesis research. And so, it's a really sort of like compact schedule and how do I push myself further to actually um, present because um, there are not many opportunities to um, go and make a post a presentation uh, especially for a year-long project so um, so this is a really nice platform to actually um, you know, tell people what my project was about um, and to get a broad broader audience and the other thing was that um, one of the one of the things that I've been doing um, as part of my uh, undergraduate um, studies is actually um, writing for school magazine. Um, it's a science magazine, and so it's really about the outreach because um, the school, my school, has both the science science types and also the more humanities types. So I spent a lot of, of my uh, undergrad trying to like you know bridge this science and non-science divide and so this video is like another like a natural extension of that to, to bring it both to the broader audience and also to a you know um, non-scientific audience because it's in, very interesting to see how people respond to the video after and they say okay so now I learned something new about you know your research on Parkinson's disease and things like that and that makes me uh, uh, really glad that you know really happy that yeah, people you know in interested in stuff like that. So hmm. fantastic. Um, so let's uh, let's get to more specifics um, of the competition. Uh, you guys, as you know, that you would you submitted a, an approval form before you've actually registered and submitted your website for the contest. Uh, what did you feel was the uh, the most important elements that you really needed to communicate or to include in that approval form uh, before the registration. Luca? Um, so I guess I thought of it as sort of a, the short description that I submitted was sort of a um, condensed abstract, I guess, written in layman's terms. Um, basically just covered a brief introduction of the topic and study questions, a bit on the methods, um, and then uh, some of the general content I'd include in the presentation. Um, I guess I the topic itself has been in my mind for the last four years now. Um, at that point, I guess the last three years. And so 
it's something I'd thought a lot about, and so I'd have I'd already written a lot of abstracts for other presentations, so it wasn't mm-hmm. too hard to put together a short description, but it was essentially just a, a short description of what my research was going to be about. So you had prior experience in writing abstracts for, like, scientific abstracts. Mm-hmm. Um, is there an advice that you can give to um, someone who's less experienced on what to actually include or how to go about the abstract? Because it, it can be hard trying to capture the essence of the project in um, in a very short description. So, like, how much of the methods did you have? Did you introduce your results? Did you, you know, things like that? Yeah. So, so I mean, gen- you know, the way that a scientific paper is structured, where you have the introduction and methods and um, results and discussion, a lot of times they recommend sort of formatting a, an abstract in the same way where you have a couple of sentences for each section. Um, and so that's, that's, that would be my general recommendation is don't make it too long. Just include a few sentences for each of those sections so you, you know, maybe at most have around. I think I had, like, for the actual abstract that I used in the presentation, I had, you know, like 10 sentences or something. Um, and so I'm going to go with that. Um, okay. Yeah, I guess that's my general recommendation. I actually, one of the the worries and concerns that maybe I'll talk about more later was that I didn't actually have any results. So I kind of omitted that section altogether and sort of focused more on the broader implications um, or the the methods per se. Um, And then the, yeah. So one doesn't, you don't think one would need a lot of results or significant results to actually be able to participate. So that's that's a good point. No, actually, yeah, that was a, a surprising point for me. I was pretty worried about the fact that I had no results. and, and that it, actually, It's surprising to a yeah. lot of uh, students, actually, because sometimes they get turned off by saying, oh, I don't have enough results, and they shy away from mm-hmm. uh, participating the, for that reason. The one bit of results that I had, I had submitted for a scientific publication, and so I wasn't actually allowed to present those <laughs> results. So I, I really, yeah, I really didn't have any. Yeah. Um, okay. Willick, what about you? Yeah. So when I was writing the abstract, um, well, before I wrote the abstract for Sigma Psi, I also had a little bit of practice writing uh, um, so a proposal for um, the thesis committee. And so um, sort of like by the time I got to the the stage of writing an abstract for Sigma Psi, the process was actually more of like trying more of convert, unpacking the very dense abstract that you are familiar with in science and trying to unpack that and make it more introduction heavy in a sense for a more a broader, more diverse audience, I mean, scientific audience of course, but a more diverse one because everyone has slightly different um, specialties, even if they are in the biological sciences, for example. So that was sort of like my um, approach when I was writing that. Um, uh, it wasn't that, like that. Um, that wasn't that time consuming. I think the, the most time consuming one is still the video, but yeah, we can talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're gonna get to that. Go yeah. <laughs> that, that okay. is a good point about making. At least for the the short description, it being a little bit more, a little easier to read than a typical scientific abstract. Um, so it does give you practice on um, communicating to scientific or a scientific audience versus a more general audience um, for both segments. Okay. Um, have you? Um, so I just want to ask you quickly how. How far were you in your projects when you did that? So, Willick, you said it was a one-year. Yeah. So project? I started in September 2014, and then by the time Sigma Psi was around February, March. Preparation time was around like for me it was around like February, right? Um, so less than a year. So less than a year. So so at that point, I think I had I had. Um, sort of like a couple of like toxicology essays, survival essays done and have some results for that. But I, I didn't have most of the results that I later used to defend my thesis. So uh, the it was it was interesting because I was making a video while collecting more results. <laughs> so so oh, that's how science works, right? So so that's <laughs> that's a very cool part. Like yep. I don't know where it's going to 
lead to. So my video was like, OK, going to be more introduction, and then like a teaser um, graph, and then like, OK, to see more, go to the PowerPoint, because that's when I'm still like, you know, work in progress, making my action. Like, like that's where the bulk of the scientific material actually is in, the, in PowerPoint. So I don't know like how everyone, like, uh, as you think about making a video, but um, if you are in a similar situation where you are still working on like um, getting uh, the data, um, don't be afraid of you know um, just making your video more of an introductory audience type of thing. Um, you know, just to communicate the the basics of your research before going to the actual results, which you can put outside of the video. I think. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a really good point, and uh, and I think it, yeah, definitely, um, you know, like I said before, I didn't have any results going into it, and that's because I've been thinking about this project for a while, and I had um, done some other projects sort of asking similar questions, um, but I hadn't really, you know, you know, this was still early or late winter, and the proposed experiment that I was going to do was going to run through this summer and next summer, so I literally hadn't done anything to get the data um, for my project yet. So I guess short answer would be I'd been thinking about it for a while, so it was the third year of my graduate program, but that particular project I hadn't started yet. And so the whole presentation was around, you know, very much uh, heavy on the methods, um, or heavy on the introduction, and then definitely heavy on the methods, um, you know, and trying to explain what, what I was going to be doing, and, and then also some emphasis on, on why it mattered. Um, why someone should be interested in why I'm pursuing project. this project. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I was, yeah, in terms of the stage, <laughs> very early stage. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so um, I want to ask you guys, how much time did you spend on preparing that website? So we, you know, we know that research keeps you busy, uh, whether it's in graduate school or as an undergrad. Um, so how much do you think, how many hours do you, would you say you spent on the preparing the site for your uh, pr submission? Probably, uh, Luca? OK. Um, yeah, probably a, it's hard to say because it was kind of spread out over about two weeks. Um, but I could say it was probably around three or four full days of work, um, you know, most of which maybe two out of the three, or actually three out of the four, or whatever, um, were all on the video uh, component. OK. Uh, okay. Really? For me, it took me about like a day and a half to set out everything. So I guess the first uh, part of it, I think I spent about, about four or five hours like the first day just to like figure out how Tumblr works and things like that. And then. Um, Second day was more of to set up the PowerPoint website where I uh, linked it to SlideShare and, and did a password protect and things like that because um, it was not a publication yet, so I had to do that um, the full PowerPoint slides. So there was a separate website, um, but because it's Tumblr, it's pretty easy to set things up, and there are a lot of templates available. Available, so I, yeah, it was pretty you know, straightforward. And uh, I think it was all on, like, um, the, when you first set up Tumblr, there's, like, a bunch of, like, help um, sidebars, things like that. It's, like, it's really guides you through. So, you know, just, I think the, the website was, uh, was generally speaking, it's sort of, like, good to go kind of thing. So it was user-friendly. It was um, very user-friendly. You could navigate yeah. through it and set it up easily. <laughs> yeah. OK, that's good. So, um, well, like you, you actually had an um, interesting um, video. So you had a different form of graphics. It was more like an infographic kind of thing. Uh, uh, yes. And again, for the audience, the presentation is a link for the presentation is available on the contest website uh, or web page on uh, Sigma's Eye website. Um, how did you do that? And did it require special skills? Did you solicit help from someone else? OK. so. Um, Interestingly enough, I was actually looking at previous Sigma's Psi um, uh, videos 
And one of the winners also used something similar, right? You know, some sort of like, you know, there's a hand drawing things on a video and there's a commentary going on and yeah. sort of like leads you through like the project and things like that. So um, I sort of like typed in some keywords on, on Google trying to figure out what that might be and then eventually mm -hmm. found a program. I'm not sure if it's the same program that uh, the previous winner used. I think that was like maybe two years ago or something. But uh, the one I use is Sparkle Video Scribe. That's S P A R K O L and Video Scribe. Not an endorsement or anything per se, just <laughs> saying that's what I use. Right. And then um, the yeah, the good thing is that I, I don't need like fantastic art skills to like pull that off. Right. And then the the rest of the program to, to merge that video part, um, that you know, drawing part with the the video you see at the beginning and the ending credits and all that kind of things. I I use uh, Adobe Premiere Pro. Once again, not an endorsement or anything. You could use any software out there. So um, as long as you are comfortable using it and you have people, who, you have friends or resources to help you out. And also, of course, the internet is a super good resource for me as well. So yeah, something like that. Now, did I answer like the question or? Yeah. Yeah. Like, so, um, Luca, did you use something uh, new, or do you have special tips on preparing the video? Um, I guess one of the things that I found to be really helpful, <laughs> surprisingly helpful, actually, um, I didn't have any kind of fancy animation per se. It was just sort of um, different images that kind of transitioned from one to another. Um, and it was actually using most... Uh, film editing software, you can include image stills um, and then just do transitions between them to make things appear or disappear. Um, and one of the actually easiest ways that I found to create all of the images that I use, and I was actually kind of surprised by how well this worked, um, was just PowerPoint, um, or I guess any kind of slide software would work for that matter, um, where you can you know include visuals that you just draw on screen, um, and then you can save the slide as an image. Um, I don't know, you can probably figure out by Googling it, but there's a way to just go to File, Save, and then you can save the actual slide as an image and then just upload it into the video editing software that way. Um, so I found that to be pretty helpful. Yeah, um, it's where it puts all the slides as separate images in the one folder, and mm -hmm. then you can use them as images. You can edit them as images, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, that's, a, that's a good tip, actually, because that's accessible to everyone with Microsoft. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I bet you could do it with um, the the Google Docs version of PowerPoint or whatever it's called. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, the mm -hmm. slides. Okay. Yeah. Um, in uh, terms of um, the rest of the filming, I mean, I guess it was just I think I had an iPad camera that I filmed everything with. <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing special at all. Um, okay. But, yeah. So no special equipment. No. No. One thing, I'll say that one thing that was really helpful for me just because I've had experience with it was I had uh, Final Cut Pro, um, which is just a video editing software, but you can really use, you know, the, the I forget what it's called, but it's the, the base software that comes with a Mac or a PC, and it would work just as fine. Um, I just found it helpful because I had or prior something. experience. Yeah, yeah, iMovie, yeah. yeah. Um, so... Um, hmm. And then um, I guess that suddenly came into my head. Um, so when recording a video, and well, for the video part, I, I had a had a tripod so that you know it can film me while I'm walking around the lab. In the first like introductory sequence, you see that you know, 10, 20 seconds of me walking around the, the lab, like you know. And I do yeah, there the was an interview you like and in looking into the fridge or the incubator yeah. or something. Yeah, that was. Um, the, the video camera was in the fridge. <laughs> and the incubator was actually, a, a, um, we no longer use the incubator, so. Um, oh, OK. I, so that's why I could put a video camera in. That, in that was incubator. a clever shot. <laughs> I, <yeah. laughs> no disclaimer, the, the incubator was not, because people like ask me, like, OK, I thought it was supposed to be sterile, so. <laughs> 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 your incubator, but let's have the camera in it. So, um, yeah, keeping yeah. it all clean, huh? Right, so then um, I guess one other thing would be um, when recording audio. I think audio is really important. And I think that um, one of the key things is to, if possible, um, 
if you if you have access to the microphone, use it. If you mm. don't have one, then I guess you can use a you know a phone, um, just any cell phone like, for that. But um, I guess the thing is that if you have a good audio source, it's going to make everything a lot easier down the road when you're editing and things like that. And when you record, um, just make sure your voice is close to, pretty close to the um, mic or something. So that'll help too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'd, uh, I'll make one more quick plug for a really useful resource that I had for the images, uh, particularly the photographs, some of the photographs that I used in the presentation. Um, Creative Commons has an image search where you can actually search for. Um, I guess, copyright-free images um, to use for things like this presentation. Um, highly, highly recommend it. Great resource. Uh, and along with that, that's where I got the, the music clip for the, uh, the video as well. So great resource. Yep. And if there are, like, if people want, like, people who are thinking of going into that, um, drawing video route, uh, it's also good to sometimes intersperse that with you actually talking. Because that's one of the feedback that my, uh, when I give it to some of my friends to like look at, that's one of the things they said. Like, uh, so I guess the bottom line is that it, the video still has to show that it's, things are done by you, kind of like. Mm -hmm. Like things are, like the project is there because you are you know, thinking about it and doing the work or something like that. So that in itself makes it also more interesting uh, because if you only have your face there all the time, it's not interesting. If you only have the hand there, that's not interesting either. So like put things and like shuffle things a little bit so that that's kind of like good too. Did you guys feel it was helpful to have some sound effects like music? in the background for that? I didn't get any comments on my music per se other than that the name of the song I used had to do with plants. Um, but so I, that was a good choice, huh? <laughs> I, I like the music. I don't know. I feel like music kind of can invoke a certain amount of emotion and especially if you're trying to get at a, a broad audience, um, you know, some of that emotional component I think is important. Um, I guess it's also easy to overdo music. Um, I, I guess I'm not a good authority on what that line is. <laughs> um, but it was, uh, I liked using it. Okay. Yeah, so for me, um, I guess partly because I came from well, school with a big emphasis on music, we have a conservatory, so mm. like <laughs> okay. every single friend I pass it to had something nice. to say about the music. So. <laughs> because I use different tracks for different parts of it, and so I also had to uh, make sure that I do the fade properly. Like you don't want to suddenly go from this song to that song without like a bit of silence in between, or like you know, crossfade if you're like very professional about it, but you could just like fade it in and then fade out. I mean, fade it out and then fade in a new song or something. But uh, I guess one thing is that it should match the mood of your video. Like in my case, um, first I had to talk about what Parkinson's is. So I can't really use a happy music for that. So I use a sort of sad music. Yeah, and then that, was, that was a good about choice. It. Yes, then I started talking about the research part of it, and that's when I used slightly more upbeat music. More exciting. Yeah, more mm. exciting music. And and then, um, what else? Yeah, something about music is the first feedback I got from my friends is that the music is, um, the music is too loud. You have to raise your voice, you know, you have to fight with the music, so just bring it down. And so that's why I did, and so that's often one of the m most common things, like you know, overdo the music, you know. And actually, um, I think people really catch music really well. So you can just bring it down, you know, another like six decibels or twelve decibels, and it used to work fine. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, so did you guys need to? Um 
I know uh, Lucas said you used your iPad camera, but did you um, need to borrow um, equipment from your university or from your school, or um, is that an option? I think that would I think that would have been an option, um, but I didn't need to. So um, I don't know what that would entail. But I I mean I'd be surprised if, as a student at a university, the school wouldn't let you borrow something for something like this. So yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I borrowed um, a tripod and a camera from the school, and also like um, the microphones that attach to um, the uh, the video. Uh, camera, and so it was pretty simple. It just said you have to return it within three days, so I have to like film all my things before then. Uh, but generally, it, it worked out, and I think uh, just pick a bright spot to actually, um, I mean, or, or turn on the lights or something. Make sure like it looks brighter when you are talking because uh, your video, uh, if the surroundings is like nice looking, it really improves the video. It's kind of strange, but if you are, you know, talking about research in a very dark, shady corner or something, then it does give a different vibe. So, okay, yeah. So All right. one of those things, yeah. Um, so let me ask you. Let's move, uh, change gears a little bit about to talk about the technical slideshow that you have to include on the website. Uh, what did you feel was the most important information to include in there? versus the video. I apologize. Um, so I guess the I thought of the technical slideshow as the place to include everything that I didn't include in the video and in the abstract. Um, so the the way that I was I don't know if anything's different this year, uh, but the way that I was told to create my presentation was have the video be um, for the most general audience, and then the abstract sort of intermediary, and then the technical slideshow being, you know, for people that are specialized in your field. Um, so I guess I got away with just kind of making a PowerPoint presentation that I found, you know, could include all the elements I wanted to say, um, you know, include more of the technical jargon. Uh, one of the things that um, was kind of difficult in, in creating it, I think, was that because there was no presenter uh, per se, it was just the slides, I felt kind of forced to include more text than I would usually in a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so I, I probably wouldn't present something with that much text at an actual presentation. Um, but I guess the, the judges seemed to understand that. I didn't get any negative comments on the amount of text I used um, you know, and then I also tried to intersperse it with more visuals and flowcharts and things like that, and that was helpful, um, I think. Um, so I guess that was the, the bigger challenge, I guess, for me, was trying to figure out um, how much text was okay to use, you know, without... Um, yeah, because as you said, that goes against uh, all practices for presentations. They mm -hmm. always tell you. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Don't put uh, a lot of text. Yeah. Um, and then... Um, was there's like something else? Um. Well, well go, go ahead. I'll remember what first. I can Yeah, say. I know. Yeah. So for the slides, uh, what I remember also is that the slides have to be for a more technical audience. So as I made it, I took care to make sure that I don't accidentally dumb down things the way I might have for the video, for example. Try to make sure that every every time before I start making the PowerPoint. Like, I make the slides over a couple of days. So every time I, I, you know, before I start making a PowerPoint, I tell myself, okay, this is for my research advisor. Like, this is going to be for someone who's, like, going to tear the project apart, right? And you kind of have to make sure that, like, when you do the PowerPoint, you have that in mind, you have that scientific, um, Rigor in mind as you write, and and then everything will flow from there. Because um, oftentimes we try to substitute words for um, well, and that's a good practice, especially when it comes to like communicating to general audience. But there are some technical terms that are more uh, appropriate for uh, 
the technical audience. So we go along with that, and um, you know, just for that you know, very technical slide. But one of the one of the things I do remember doing for that is spending the first like three hours just deciding what fonts to use, uh, what color of the background, and um, and what text to go with that background, um, what text color to go with that background. Maybe because I I like playing with colors and just find that uh, hobby. I don't know, but I think that aesthetic really helps because your audience is going to read a lot of text. If you're going to make it easier for them, please do that. So what do you think I, the best color combination is for a background and text? Okay, so you have to know that they are going to read it on the screen, right? Uh, and not on a... Um, so you're probably going to... They are probably going to read it on their laptops and not, say, on a projected slide. So that also changes things. So since they're reading on screen, the background uh, usually should be something that's uh, less and should be slightly more of a um, calming color, the background. So something like white, sometimes if it's too bright, can be off-putting also, especially if you're reading um, on like a very bright display already, like um, current um, you know, laptop screens and things like that. So. I use a slightly darker background. But I made sure that uh, when my, my texts aren't so bright that it jumps out and like burns people's eyes. When you look away and you see the text on the wall, you know it's too bright. You, so you go back and like tweak the text again to make sure that it's just the right um, thing. And also there's something like um, on probably can, can Google that is something to do with color theory, something to do with like what color matches what color and and those things definitely help a lot. And this, so there's no one set, like, oh, this is a good color combination, but it's more of like a, okay, you can, you can, you can find software that, or things that tell you, like, these are the, just the right shades that work with each other. So you can use them and hmm. they'll work out. Yeah. All right. I'll add in just a quick color note on that. Just a general present. I guess this applies to any kind of presentation, but there's a lot of people that are uh, red green colorblind. So mm. combining oh, those colors, can, those colors really can be hard point. to distinguish sometimes, especially if they're in a figure. Um, so yeah, just something to keep in mind. That's an excellent point. All right. Um, so let's move to the nerve-wracking phase. The judging phase. <laughs> uh, well, let me let me add one more quick comment about the um, the slide. Show. I was worried that um, I wasn't using up all the slides that were allotted. I think I only had twenty three slides of I don't know twenty seven. I don't remember what the limit was. Um, and I was worried. In retrospect, I think that's kind of silly because you should only present on what you need to present on and don't be repetitive. Um, so don't worry if you don't have to use up all the slides. Just a quick recommendation of that. <laughs> okay. yep. yeah. And I guess also most of the, I guess before you make a slide, you already, if you already have like um, an outline in mind, like, okay, I'm going to talk about these things, uh, just these things, especially for people who have lots, like, lots of things to cover, then choosing something that makes a good coherent story will be better than throwing everything wholesale and for me, it's like um, these are all the things I had. But if someone is doing a sort of like PhD and have a lot of data already, then you might want to find something that makes that story neat instead of trying to fill everything up. Does it make sense? It does. Yeah. Okay. So so let's go on to the next question. Okay. Well, before before judging, actually. Um, did you guys get support from your colleagues, from your advisors, um, and what sort of or what form of support were you getting? And did you find that helpful? Was it feedback? Was it ideas? Um, what kind of help did you get from the from people around you, basically? Luca. Um, so, <clears throat> just some some simple. Um, points of help where I had someone that helped me film, so I had like a cameraman basically. Um, I had I got some useful comments on the abstract for the presentation from uh, some of my colleagues in the lab. 
Um, but then the greatest help of all, which I would actually tell everyone to do, is um, so I had my parents look at drafts of my video, um, and they're very non-academically minded. Um, so it was actually incredibly helpful to get feedback from a very general audience like that at the early stages of creating the video so that I could see, you know, some of the blind spots where, you know, essentially I'd, I've been using the same word over and over again, and then I don't realize that most of the world doesn't know what that means. Um, so it was, I'd recommend that as one of the, the greatest helps, at least that I got, um, in doing the whole presentation was getting feedback from non-academics, especially on the video. That's a great point. Yeah, getting feedback from audience that mimics the the actual uh, the audience who will actually be judging your presentation. It's great. Uh, uh, like? Yeah. So it goes along the same lines as what Luca said. Um, well, well, I pass it to one of my friends who um, he actually probably watches more YouTube than study, but. <laughs> hey, that came in handy, right? <laughs> that makes him like the perfect person to like look at this because he judges that against all the other YouTube videos he has seen. And so <laughs> by listening to his comments, I was able to like increase the entertainment value of my uh, video a little bit. But of course, like um, like two years later, I also had to find ways to like make sure that the actual science that I was trying to present makes sense to people who really want to find out what the project is, but you know, may not have uh, the same background. So I, I was fortunate to have, uh, to be in a class, a rhetoric class actually, uh, where we were like doing writing of our papers. And so for one of the smaller term projects, I, I presented this video and, and let them like, um, you know, give me all the critiques. And we were talking about um, comparative literature major, uh, a French major, a history major, uh, um, organist, she plays the organ, and uh, they are like, well, all of them are, don't have a science background, but that's perfect. That's like, basically, we we're just talking about that in class and trying to like, you know, like, talk about like how the video, like, did you understand everything in the video, like all that kind of things, and and so that was fantastic. So I guess going along with uh, what Luca said, and give it to people who. Preferably, don't have an idea of what your project is about, and that's the first time listening to all these talk about plant pollination or, um, you know, Parkinson's disease or something. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. That's uh, the true test. And then ask them, okay, how much do you know after that video? Mm. Yeah. If they can tell you something, okay, that's a good sign. Hmm. That's a great point. Yeah. Very, very true. Yeah. Very true. All right, thank you. That's that's a really excellent point. All right, judging. <laughs> so, what did you guys? What were you doing during that judging period? And um, how many judges were looking at your website and your presentation? Let's start with Willick. Okay, so I'm gonna switch or, gears. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when I first um, looked at it, I think. Um, I, I guess I had about like 30-ish comments, 30 or so comments, and some of them were repeat comments, so I answered the question and it came back again. So that was very interesting. And then after that, I looked at the Tumblr, um, Google Analytics, and so it was probably something like two spikes, and so probably those, I don't know how Sigma Site works, this is just my, my um, kind of like theorizing from you know, that graph is that there probably was like a, like a, you know, you send people off to, the judges off to like judge various videos and then there's like one grand round or something where like they all look at one video or something. So I saw a spike that was like maybe 40 or 50 or something like that in a 24 hour span. But um, that that seems to be, oh, that of course it doesn't mean that all of them are judges. There might be also people who are just um, uh, interested and in, in taking a look at it. Yeah. But uh, that's, um, as I think the number of people who, who came in and um, looked at them, uh, look at the website. Uh, let's see what else. Yeah, something cool is that um, the, the variety of questions that I got from the judge, judges was a lot more diverse than uh, the questions that my thesis committee might ask me. The thesis committee would have asked me, well, questions that are um, kind of like, very specific 
detailed questions, but um, less oddball questions, you know, like in in this setting, there's a lot more, like, say, like, freedom in a, in a way of, like, asking questions about, you know, what if questions. And so that was very interesting to me, uh, trying to um, explain uh, my data in light of these what if questions from the judges. judges. Okay. Yeah, um, definitely echo everything that you said. It, um, it was really, really exciting to see, yeah, the range of questions that I got um, and the quantity of, you know, really, even, I, I definitely, I would say that even some of the questions were, you know, questions at the level of detail that I would get from my committee. Um, so that was, that was really enlightening. Um, I... Just for a short answer of what I did during the judging period, I checked for comments as often as I could, um, and that I found that to be really helpful because, um, actually, for some of the same reasons that Wheelick mentioned, sometimes um, judges would comment and say, oh, you know, I was going to ask you some questions, but you answered them in some previous comments um, already. And so, yes, and then I tried to respond as soon as possible, and uh, in some cases, you know, some of the longer responses I might type into a word processor just so that I didn't lose the answer while I was typing if the internet crashed or something. Um, but it was very, it was very, very enlightening. It felt like I was um, at a conference with a poster or a present or a, an oral presentation, but with the number of comments was way greater uh, than at any actual physical conference I've ever been to. Um, way more detailed, uh, you know, very much of a discussion. There was a lot of back and forth between a lot of the comments. Um, and uh, there was something else I was going to say. Um, oh, yeah, the, you asked about the number of judges that we had? Yeah, like how ask? many? How many? Yeah. So at the end of the, the um, showcase, we received a, a list of, of specific feedback that each judge had about our presentation overall. And I think I had around 40-something judges on that list. Uh, but the actual number of judges that commented um, was more, I think it was around 18 or so. Um, but then those 18 comments, you know, like I said, kind of continued off into discussion threads and uh, led to some really interesting insights and resources and exchanges. And so it was very, very insightful. Which is a significantly large number compared to giving a poster presentation at a conference because you're not going to have probably, I mean... 40 people actually critically, critically critiquing your presentation and giving you constructive feedback and actually um, dissecting everything and providing a, a statement. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. amazing. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I think that's one of the greatest parts about this whole research, research, research showcase is the fact that uh, you can really have contact with so many scientists that actually, you know, put in their volunteer time to carefully look at your presentation and give you careful comments. Um, so I really appreciate that, and I'm grateful for all the judges that, that did that, um, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it's really interesting because the, you know, when they, when they ask questions, I would um, reply, and then they would come up with more questions, or sometimes they would be like, oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's really good, thanks. It's something. very interactive, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and so uh, it feels like you're, like, you know, right there, post a session, except you have more time to think, to give mm. a response. And so I really like that part where, you know, you are not put on the spot or something like that because you're online and you really have the time to, like, okay, cite the source if you want to back up a claim, you know, on, on the comment section, like, usually cite something, you know, I cite a paper if I, you know, trying to, like, explain why I, you know, uh, did a research, uh, uh, why I followed this investigation in that line of thought the way I did. So that, that made it really helpful because I don't think I would have been able to, like, write there on the spot and post a presentation and say, okay, so-and-so 2005 said blah, 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 <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. That's so. great. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, you two won um, an award last year for your presentation, and that was um, out of many, many uh, websites that were submitted. Um, so there must have been something very unique um, to your own website or to your submission. 
what do you think it was? What do you think made your presentation stand out? What do you think made it unique or um, just caught the attention and made it worthy of that award? Luca? From your perspective, thinking yeah. back. Yeah, yeah, it's a hard question. <laughs> I know it uh, is. <laughs> I can only really base it off the, the comments that I received. Um, so I guess some of the the more positive comments that I received had to do with um, the the general appeal um, to a broader audience, uh, the broader implications of the research, and the fact that I kind of tried to emphasize those uh, more. Um, that's that's sort of just generally based on the comments. Um, I think some of the other things that might have helped uh, was just trying to be as engaged as possible with the the responding to comments as I could, sort of taking it as a as a way to improve on the research itself and sort of welcoming any and all feedback that I could. And in that way, I was also sort of able to fill a lot of gaps that maybe I was missing in the presentation. And as more judges read the comments and the presentation, it sort of created a more complete picture of the whole research, you know, where, you know, some of maybe something I left out by accident, you know, was addressed in the comments. So that, that probably helped. Um, in, the thing that I feel really personally about is the human element, and that's sort of where I came at with came at this project with was um, trying to focus on my own passion and excitement for plant ecology and trying to emphasize that a bit in my presentation. And I think a lot of that kind of resonated with a lot of the judges saying that they appreciated that um, you know I was really passionate and excited about what I did. And I I think that that helps. You know, even if someone can feel happier and more excited because you were more excited and passionate, then they're more likely to enjoy the research that you're doing um, and appreciate it. Um, at least that's that's how I see it, you know, from my point of view. Um, so, I don't know. All right. Yeah. So, for me, um, actually, when I was, um, you know, doing the, um, the Q&A part of it, the judging part of it, I was actually at a conference with my professor. So, um, oh. so in the day I was at a conference. So I was like, um, you know, presenting my posters, my poster, and um, answering questions in real life. And hmm. then at night I was like typing away, you know, trying to answer the questions that come in. That's great. My phone. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out very well like, with that timing. You know, I was thinking about only one thing at that point in my life. And that was like, you know. <laughs> Being you know like super engaged in research and and you know as uh, you know um, responding to the questions in a in a way that's like both professional and also demonstrate that you know I've been thinking about this research for a long time things like that and so um, I you know like just like over um, you know, I was just chit chatting with my advisor that day I was like yeah so you know last night I received a lot of feedback on like the website what do you think and then he said. Oh, it's a good sign, you know, if people are asking you questions, it's a big sign that you are, you know, getting somewhere with your video and website. So, you know, just uh, go ahead and answer the questions. I'm sure you'll be great. And so, it's, I guess one of the things is that if you have, to us later on, you see that you have a lot of questions on the thing, try and answer them, like, double quick time. I mean, like, make sure that you, you have a good answer, of course, but, you know, continue putting things there so that this website is alive and that's going to really sort of like you know impress the other judges who come into the website and see that oh, okay there's already a lot of activity going on here you know yeah. and they're more likely to type in something as well so yeah yeah that means they're interested if they if you're getting exactly. a lot of yeah, yeah. a lot of comments and feedback all right um, so Tell me one thing or two things that you really learned from participating in this contest and that it's something that you feel like you can take that further in your career as a scientist. Luca? That, you know, that's it's not an easy question, not because I didn't learn a lot, um, but because it's hard to point towards any one skill, I guess. Um, two skills. I was <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I would say in general, it really made me way more comfortable and, and exposed me really for the first time to presenting science um, in this, you know, 
visual medium, you know, multimedia, slideshow presentation, abstract, and video, um, trying to get at both a broader audience and a more scientific audience. Uh, you know, I think this digital multimedia form of presentation is just going to become more and more popular, and so just the pure exposure to it was just amazing for me. Um, and so that, you know, practicing, I guess the process of creating the video in and of itself was very enlightening uh, in terms of the types of, um, you know, how to turn something that's very scientific into something that a more general audience can understand. Uh, and like I mentioned before, a lot of that came from showing the video to people that were not um, academically minded. Um, but I would say maybe that, yeah, I guess if you call that a skill, that would probably be the biggest one for me, um, is is learning how to make that transition between the scientific and the um, the more general. Which is a great skill for a scientist. Uh, I mean, we always need to be uh, able to communicate to outside of our um, circle of scientists, you know, and show actually the relevance and the importance of what we do. Yeah, that's that's essential. Um, I mean, I think if if it wasn't for that, then there wouldn't really be a point for science, I guess, because exactly. science really should apply to everyone. Um, exactly. So being able to communicate it well is is, is essential, you know, especially if um, it's hard to get funding, you know, nowadays, you know, with crowdsourcing and all that, you there's a lot of other ways to get funding that yeah. That's sort of rely on that. Yeah. yeah. So on that note, another thing, um, one thing that I've learned a lot from that um, the entire process is that um, how do you actually, you know, storyboard your project? And I use the word storyboard because um, it's really like painting a, a picture for your audience, and it, and you lead them into a project, you, you put them through the um, this whole process of uh, not just like hey, this is this is all my data. No, it's more like a you know why does it matter? And there's this thing, and you know this is mysterious, and we don't know about it. And you know people are um, affected because uh, of something, something, and we don't know why. Uh, and maybe there's this environmental co cost, right? And so um, I put them through, I, I lead them through this journey, and and then I go into like hey, this is my research. And then so this aspect I guess of like storyboarding and like painting a picture is something I really learned from this contest. And I guess a, a big part of it is because there's um, a video and a uh, component of that and so that really like helps activate a creative creative moment for me. <laughs> and uh, one other thing that I've learned is how to um, do something even though um, it's unknown. Like I don't know anything about making videos. So the first thing I did when I actually like decided I want to sign up is to post on my school forum saying, "Is anyone good at making videos? Like I can like you know you can chit chat and I can maybe pay you twenty dollars to to you know do something." Nobody responded. <laughs> so maybe it's like not enough money. But <laughs> so like I was Sounds like, enough to sad. me." <laughs> I was kind of sad, but I decided that you know I'm going to like do this and I'm going to like um, try it out, even if like I have no idea how to go about go about doing that. And so um, it was good that I was able to like um, access the resources, like the video cameras and things like that. And there were like um, people at the um, computer help desk who, well, you know, they fix computers, but they also have like uh, uh, an area where they help people with um, you know making videos or things like that or like um, uh, more generally just like media related things in my school. So um, the people there were very helpful and were able to give a couple of tips on how to do these things. And so um, I guess it's just um, don't be afraid and like, you know, yeah, rock on with your video making or your PowerPoint presentation making and you'll be good, yeah. Okay. Yep, for well, sure, yeah. All right. Well, we are actually out of time. Uh, I really want to thank you guys uh, very much for taking the time to um, share your experience and your tips on how to prepare for the Student Research Showcase that is a contest sponsored by uh, Sigma Xi, the Scientific Research Society. And um, thank you all again for coming. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You.
right. I encourage Thanks, everyone man. to do it. <laughs> it's All just right. a fantastic experience, so thank you. Yep. Great. Thank you very much, and um, let's hope that this year will also be a record year with the number mm -hmm. of people applying and, and also like uh, making presentations because there will be really cool celebration of all the research going on. All it's right, that's the spirit. Yeah. I'm excited <laughs> right. to see it. All right. All right, all right bye. 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 <laughs>